Hi, I'm Seben Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Smart Power Distribution Unit or SPDU. This work was done in collaboration with Oded and Evgeny of IRP Systems in Esciona, Israel. There is a relevant video to this presentation, Losses of Power Inductors and PWM Converter Revised, it's a revised version. And here is the link, and I'm going also to print this link on the YouTube page of the video that you are now watching. Please be advised that some of the concepts and circuits shown in this presentation are covered by RRP Systems patent. Now the conventional configuration of a power distribution unit looks like this. Usually there are going to be like two batteries or more, but usually it will be two batteries. This is the power distribution unit. And here is the load, in this case I'm showing an inverter and a motor that will be like a personal mobility unit. Now why two batteries? Because uh, we like to replace the batteries, we like to charge them, they are not charged on board. Now we don't want one big battery because it's heavy and it's difficult to carry. So therefore it is preferred to have say two batteries that you can take out, charge and bring back. So this is the conventional configuration. A more advanced configuration would be like using a contactor so that uh, you can connect one battery or another. This is a bit dangerous. You have to be sure that uh, you won't have a short here between the batteries if the voltages are not the same. Here there are diodes which automatically will connect the two batteries when the voltages are the same and then only the high voltage battery will be connected and the other one will be disconnected. But of course here we have a power dissipation due to the voltage drop on the dial. A more sophisticated approach will be to use the transistor but again you have to be extremely careful because if you turn on the transistor and then you plug in a battery which is of a higher voltage than this one then it's going to be a short so you have to be have a quick turn off of uh, this switch in case of the reverse voltage. And then of course we can use a back-to-back uh, -to, -back to transistor but then again the control is uh, rather complex and then therefore there are some reliability issues. In any case in this conventional approach you can use one battery if one battery has a higher voltage than the other and you can use the two batteries only if the voltages are the same so they can be connected in parallel. Now here comes the smart power distribution unit in which we have sharing of the power between the two batteries even if the voltages are not the same. And this is valid for both powering and regeneration because in a car for example you like to have regeneration when braking and therefore you have to have the capability of bidirectionality of the current flow uh, between the battery and the inverter. So the system has to support both the forward and the regeneration direction of current flow. Now the basic specification of the SPDU unit developed by RRP system are as follows. We have a voltage range of 36 to 75 so we have two number of types of battery that it can accommodate. We have a continuous current per battery of 130 amp, continuous current per two batteries double of that, and then peak current for a short time of 260 amp per one battery or double of that for two batteries. So this is these are the specifications. And here is the basic concept that we are talking about. Here are the power units. Here, of course, we are talking about batteries, but it could be actually a supercapacitors. We have two batteries. And then we have switches here to the bus. This is the bus going to the source. Could be the inverter, could be a charger. And then we have a controller controlling the bidirectional power converter uh, between these two batteries. In this case, we can have quite a number of operational modes. We have one case in which we connect the battery directly to the bus. This is the normal case, one battery is operational. But then we can have one battery connected to the bus and then if this battery has a lower voltage, 
we can use some of the power from this battery on demand or in fact we can charge this battery through this bidirectional converter in order to bring the voltage here quickly to the same voltage as this power unit here. And then of course we can use in the case that we have a switch which is um, bidirectional, we can actually operate with the lower voltage battery and then communicate or transfer power in and out of the higher voltage battery. So the, all these are possible and of course we would like very quickly to get to the point in which the two batteries have the same voltage and then these two switches are on and the, con the converter does not operate. This is the desired and preferred operation and by these modes you can very quickly reach it. And here is a general view of the implementation and this will be for the so-called uh, full-fledged design. We have a bi-directional switch on the two sides. We have the two batteries here, current sensing, voltage sensing, and then we have this bi-directional converter which can operate in a back mode, in a boost mode, or back boost when the voltages are closed and you like to have fine control of the power transfer. A sort of an intermediate design would be having a transistor on which side. In this case, the battery with the higher voltage will always be connected to the bus. Of course, you can turn on the transistor. And then uh, when this uh, power unit gets to the same power level, you turn on uh, this transistor, uh, then you get uh, conduction through the RDS1 with a better efficiency. So this is like an intermediate design and say a poor boy's option would be to use just two diodes and then the battery with the highest voltage is always clamped and then you have the unit here which can transfer power back and forth through this channel here and then when the voltage of these two is equal then the two diodes will be conducting. This of course entails a power loss um, voltage drop on the dial. Now for the high power that we required we have to go to a multiple arrangement here, a multi-phase and of course if it's a multi-phase it's going to be an interleave and for two reasons. First of all to sort of share the current between the a number of transistor because the current is just too high for one transistor and then also by having this multi-phase we can have interleaved and therefore we are reducing the ripple here at the two ends while the ripple in the inductor could be fairly high but when it sort of uh, cancels out by this uh, offset of the interleaved we'll get a lower ripple here and here to demonstrate it I have a simulation this is just in the back mode in this case all these transistor of the high side are on so this is connected here okay for the back here we turn on all these and these are off and then we have the four inductors and they are interleaved and here we see some waveforms this is for say one inductor this will be the ripple uh, here fairly high ripple here and these are the controls for the four phases the gate control and here are the current of the uh, four inductors and you see that they are interleaved and obviously now if you look at the output and input we see here the ripple uh, the red here is the ripple for one phase or like one inductor and here is for the four of course there is a quite a bit of a ripple reduction here and then we have also here a case of um, the other side that is where all the inductors are sort of funneled in and then we have the ripple of one inductor if it would have been one inductor only and of the four inductors and quite a bit of a attenuation of the ripple which is of course very desirable and here I'm showing the RMS values this is for the single inductor and here is the function of the duty cycle we have a maximum at 0.5 and this is for the two sides, this is the inductor side, this is the switching side and here is the RMS uh, for the case of the interleaved inductors or interleaved operation 
this is the inductor side and this is now the switching side quite a bit of a reduction between the single operation single inductor operation and a multi-phase this is explained and demonstrated in the video that I have referenced and it's going to be printed, the link is going to be printed on the page of this uh, YouTube video that you are now watching. Now what is the desired operating frequency? We like to have small inductors and then we have to have lower losses. Obviously the higher the frequency the smaller the inductor. The lower losses brings up a problem here or a question I should say because we know that the losses of a ferrite material are going up with frequency. So if you go up with frequency, the question is whether you are gaining or losing because they, for the same B max, that is the magnetic flux density, uh, the higher the frequency, the higher the loss. So the common wisdom might be that uh, it will be better to work at a lower frequency where the ferrite losses are lower. But as I've shown in the previous uh, video that I've referenced, this is not the case. And I'm demonstrating it here in sort of a more intuitive way by using the following plot here. This is a typical loss plot for a ferrite material, in this case three F3 of uh, ferrox cube. Here is the power loss in kilowatt per meter cube, which is like milliwatt per centimeter cube, which is more reasonable, and they are the same numbers, and then here are the frequencies, and here is the B max, magnetic flux density. This is for small signal sinusoidal excitation, which is not the case here, but nonetheless we can get an understanding from this plot what is really going on. So here I'm showing say this is say like a reference point 100 milli tesla and the loss would be something like 70 milliwatt per centimeter cube okay that's here now if i double the frequency i go to this curve here however when doubling the frequency the b peak is going down because it is uh, inversely proportional to the frequency the higher the frequency the lower is the peak-to-peak -peak value of the current, there, therefore the peak-to-peak -peak value of the magnetic flux density. So actually as I go to 200, I have a lower loss. And then if I go to 25 kilohertz, which is a lower frequency, which is four times lower, then the losses become very high. So clearly what is more important here is the fact that the B peak is changing rather than the frequency and therefore it seems that it will be desirable indeed to work at high frequency. Now I'm showing this here in a sort of an intuitive way. Switching frequency is going up with frequency. Core losses, as I've said, are going actually down because the effect of the reduction in the B peak is more important than the increase of the frequency loss. Okay? And then the conduction losses are really depend on the resistance, but then at high frequency we're going to have a skin effect, proximity effect, so the conduction losses are going to be high. So if I sum all these up for the inductor and the MOSFET in terms of switching and conduction losses, I see that there is a reduction here as the frequency goes up, but then this is for a fixed inductor, okay? and we are changing just the frequency, the same current of course, average current. So we see a reduction in the losses and then obviously at very high frequency they start shooting up. Okay, so if you are in this region you'd like to go to as a higher frequency as you can. So here are actually some temperature measurements of three inductors which are operated in a three-phase interleaved buck. Okay? Each inductor is 6 microhenry. The input voltage is 50 volt, the output is 22, so the duty cycle is about 0.5, which is like almost the maximum ripple for a single inductor, for this single inductor, each one of these. 
and then we have a total output current of 130, so the average current for each inductor is 43 amp. Now, the ripple for 50 kilohertz and 100 kilohertz are, of course, a factor of 2. 50 kilohertz is 36 amp, and in 100 kilohertz it's 18 amp. So if I look here, I see clearly that at 50 kilohertz, the maximum temperature is 87, and here it's only 58, okay, at 100 kilohertz. That is, the temperature rise, if the room is about 25, say, is for the 50 kilohertz 62 degrees, and for the 100 kilohertz is only 23 degrees. So the ratio of the temperature rise is about 2.7, that's a lot, okay? So this shows that the increase in the delta B, the B max, as you go down in frequency is very important, very harmful. So you go to, you like to go to a higher frequency in this frequency range with this material. So this is not a general conclusion, this is for this particular case. So this brings me to the end of this uh, presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found it of interest and perhaps it will bring to you some ideas of implementing uh, such systems in the future. Thank you very much.